I'm Dr. Prabhakoti Shwaran, Reader in Law and Social Justice at the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London. I'm co-editor with other academics of Beyond Trafficking and Slavery, an editorial partnership at Open Democracy. We have researchers from Africa, Asia, America, Australia and Europe. At BTS, we seek to challenge the empty sensationalism of mainstream media accounts of exploitation and domination. However, we are also interested in going beyond critique. In other words, how do we translate our critical voice into one that also engages with law and policy makers, as well as other stakeholders in a meaningful way? With that in mind, we are here today to discuss the Modern Slavery Act of 2015, which was passed by the British Parliament in March 2015 with a view to eradicating modern slavery in the UK. Joining me today to discuss the act is Vicky Brotherton, who is coordinator of the Anti-Trafficking Monitoring Group and is based at Anti-Slavery International. Vicky, welcome to King's. Thank you. So you're based at Anti-Slavery International and work on behalf of the Anti-Trafficking Monitoring Group. So tell us a little bit about the group and about your own experience working on trafficking. Sure. So the Anti-Trafficking Monitoring Group was set up in 2009. Um, the UK ratified the Council of Europe Trafficking Convention, which provided for a monitoring body or rapporteur but the UK didn't put one in place, um, saying that the interdepartmental ministerial group was sufficient. Civil society were concerned by this, so uh, got together and created the ATMG um, to undertake research to see how well the UK was implementing the convention. Um, since it started, it's been doing um, targeted research, looking at specific aspects of the convention, such as protection, prevention, prosecution. Um, I joined the ATMG in... Um, 2013, um, when the Modern Slave Act was just being introduced. So my uh, my work is mainly focused on that, although we've gone back to research function at the moment. Personally, prior to the um, uh, prior to starting at the AHMG, I actually was working for Anti Slavery International on a different human trafficking project, which was called the Race in Europe Project, which stands for the Response Against Criminal Exploitation. Um, I did that for um, a year or two. Um, I have a human rights background um, and a research background. Um, I studied human rights um, at master's level in the um, University of London and also worked overseas supporting uh, trafficking victims in Thailand uh, and also uh, worked for ECPAP UK, which works with child trafficking on a voluntary basis. Thank you. So there's a lot of outrage over modern slavery and trafficking and this outrage uh, in the popular media is actually matched by the sheer elasticity of the concepts um, of slavery, trafficking, and forced labor. So what is your understanding of any of these terms? And in fact, what is ATMG's organizational understanding of these terms? What, In other words, what drives your efforts to counter these phenomena? Sure. Um, so as I said, the, the ATMG was set up to be the monitoring body for the Council of Europe Trafficking Convention. So our focus is on human trafficking. However, when the Modern Slavery um, Act was uh, announced that it was going to be introduced, we had to really kind of sit down and think, what do we understand by this? Because we, um, this term modern slavery was not one that's, you know, in international law, for instance. Um, so we did bring together civil society and lawyers and said, please, let's have this discussion about what it encapsulates. Um, and I think we had to, to some degree, accept what the government were saying and modern slavery was. But there were some people at this discussion group saying that um, human trafficking can be for the purposes of forced labour, servitude, slavery. So maybe the human trafficking should encapsulate all other forms of, of slavery. Whereas other people were saying that modern slavery could be the catch-all term, but within that you have the human trafficking, forced labour, slavery, servitude. Um, so there was a lot of discussion... Um, and I think what we ended up doing in terms of our alternative bill was really adhering to international law and the definitions within them, so human trafficking, standalone, forced labour standalone, slavery, servitude, etc., and keeping the distinct. And then the umbrella term, which we, you know, was done by the government, was then used to encapsulate all those separate um, different um, aspects. Mm -hmm. So... Um when you say human trafficking, what, what is your paradigmatic case that you have in mind when you're trying to counter 
trafficking through law. Can you spell that again? So what is your what is your you know, what kinds of cases are you thinking of when you think of trafficking? All kinds of cases. I mean, trafficking can be for the purpose of, you know, for slavery, servitude, um, criminal exploitation. Um, looking to like the EU um, definition in the um, trafficking directive and also the Council of Europe trafficking mm-hmm. convention. Um, so it can be for the purpose of sexual exploitation, domestic um, work. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of, I think this is one of the issues that maybe we'll come on to is that the the definition within the offences in the Modern Slavery Act of human trafficking really focused on the travel, whereas we know that in international law it can be a number of different acts, not all of which involved movement. Um, so that was one of our key kind of pushes for the government to really try and make them adhere more closely and closely align with international definitions. Um, so I think trafficking, as we understand it, can be for... Um, a huge range of purposes and done in a vast number of ways. I think there's been greater understanding recently about um, UK victims and how they can be trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation, um, which may not have been previously recognised. But there's also greater recognition that it's not just sexual exploitation, it's forced labour. That's why you've got you know organisations such as Flex coming to the floor because of the recognition of the increasing numbers uh, of people trafficked for forced labour as well. Mm-hmm. That's very useful. So tell us a little bit about ATMG's involvement in the processes leading up to the passage of the Modern Slavery Act. So the ATMG, as I said, was mainly a research body that looked at um, different aspects. And one of the reports that we did in 2012, which was published in 2013, was looking at prosecutions. One of the recommendations that we made was to um, have a consolidated act which would bring together all of the kind of disparate pieces of legislation into into one um, umbrella piece and within that have also protection and prevention measures. Um, so we were pleased when we heard that this Modern Slave Act was going to be introduced um, and were excited about the, the prospect of having this, this comprehensive piece of legislation. Um, when it was announced in summer 2013, Um, the Home Secretary tasked Frank Field to undertake a review. So we were engaged with that. We gave oral and written evidence to the review and we're very pleased by his uh, report that he published in terms of its breadth. It was comprehensive. We were worried when we first engaged with the review, we got very kind of negative feedback from those who were undertaking it about what this bill could include and how wide it could be because of the parliamentary timetables, because it was going to be rushed through. So we were concerned that this report would reflect what the government was saying. But actually, it came out and it was quite quite strong in terms of what it asked for. The draft bill that was, um, uh, what was it, published in December 2013, in comparison, it was published on the same day, which begs the question, why was someone tasked to do a review? but it was published on the same day and we were very concerned. So as a, an ATMG, we were in a strong position already being a coalition to bring together civil society and lawyers. So we had what we called the Day of Deliberation in January, January where we sat down with the draft bill and went, OK, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with the drafting? How can we improve it? Also, what is missing? Alongside this, we were also, once we heard that the Modern Slavery Act was going to be introduced, we, um, sorry, Modern Slavery Bill was going to be introduced, we worked with um, Freshfield's um, solicitors to create an alternative bill. The premise being behind that, that we knew that we weren't going to get everything in this draft Modern Slavery Bill um, and when it was introduced, but we could use those provisions that we drafted um, to say this is the gold standard if you're going to adhere to your international norms and be this world-leading country, then this would be what we think it should look like and use as the basis of amendments. So that was when the... That was January 2014, and the Joint Committee on the Draft on Slavery um, Bill was tasked to do further scrutiny, and they asked us to do, um, as well as written oral submissions, they asked us to do um, a specific report on the national referral mechanism. Um, so we did that for them, we did a five-year review f- to feed into the scrutiny process. 
um, and again engage as much as we could with this joint committee and the scrutiny that was being undertaken. So that was all before the, the modern slavery bill was introduced into Parliament in June 2014. Mm -hmm. And once it was introduced, how did the group continue its work? So we again sat down and went, great, it's been somewhat strengthened. I think the, the government did listen to a certain degree what was said in the joint... Um, The um, Joint Committee did, to some degree, listen to what was in... Um, sorry, the Government did listen to what the Joint Committee said, to some degree, because it was it had a victim protection section in this modern slavery bill that was introduced compared to the draft bill. It had um, you know, a, a raft of different um, provisions which were victim-focused, although they weren't as strong as we'd like them to see, but they must have, to some degree, listened. So we again sat down, brought together um, lawyers including Paris Chandran, I think, um, he was speaking to. She um, came to this meeting again, went through the different um, provisions that was in uh, the draft, sorry, the Mon Slavery Bill, and discussed kind of what we could uh, come back at the government with in terms of briefings and amendments. And as the ATMG, we sat down and we strategised about what are the key things? We knew that we couldn't get everything changed, but what were the key things? So the key things were things like um, the uh, definition of human trafficking, it was the uh, presumption of age clause, which is a small thing, um, victim protection, so having kind of uh, minimum standards, the, the, the framework of the national referral mechanism, overseas domestic workers, a stronger remit for the commission. We had about six to eight different strategy um, kind of points. And within the ATMG, we kind of split into subgroups and said, you guys work on that, you work on that, you work on that. And it was the responsibility of those different groups to lead the work on each of these different um, uh, issues. The children's issues that we had, um, so child guardianship was one of our issues that we wanted to see included. Also the separate child exploitation offence and a stronger a statutory defence and the non-punishment provision. Those children's organisations within the ATMG worked with a wider coalition um, of organisations um, that were brought together really by the kind of refugee, um, uh, sorry, Children's Society and the Refugee Children's Consortium, um, who were great at very uh, good at organising people's time and um, really um, using their networks to find the right MPs to target and lobby and work with. Um, so we were just, like I said, just got into the subgroups and each of those groups, at every single kind of scrutiny phase in the House of Lords and Commons, where it was felt to be needed, worked with MPs and peers to draft amendments, write briefing papers, write speaking notes, meet with them, really kind of undertake their own uh, lobbying path. So when is struck by looking at the parliamentary debates um, as to how involved civil society actors were and the extent to which actually you know, members of parliament and the laws were proactive um, in forwarding some of their proposals. So what is your sense uh, as a civil society actor in terms of what role you might have played in the, the passage of the act? I think civil society played a really crucial role. Um, there was, I mean, modern slavery isn't, it shouldn't be a contentious issue in terms of hard to sell to the public or the government. Um, but it was quite... Uh, the pushback we got sometimes was quite, to me, surprising. The things we were asking for, which if we were to you know, meet the government rhetoric of being this world-leading um, government and also introducing this comprehensive victim-focused legislation, um, the things we were asking should have been included, but they weren't. But I was pleasantly surprised by, obviously, the, the opposition uh, at that time, Labour, were um, were fantastic at working, you know, getting MPs to really take forward certain issues, um, and especially the Lords as well. Um, a lot of crossbenchers were fantastic. Um, a lot had their own specialisms and their own right, um, and they voted more on principle rather than kind of political kind of sides. Um, so I was surprised by 
sometimes the strength of knowledge that was already there um, and how people were prepared to break kind of the party whip to, to vote in favour of things um, which they were told that they shouldn't. Um, but again, I think I think civil society had a, had a big influence, but I maybe I'm naive to this, but I was still disappointed by how much work it took to get the most simple of changes included. Um, and I think perhaps, maybe I'm speaking out of turn here, but um, perhaps the government are a little... Um, we're a little arrogant in the drafting of certain provisions when we know we have international standards which are um, you know, recognised standards across the EU um, and yet they still felt they had to deviate and create their own drafting which from the evidence we got from lawyers um, and people working on the front line who have to implement these things said that's, that's not going to work, this is actually going to be more problematic. For instance, the drafting of the statutory defence, you know, introducing a reasonable person test, um, having a whole raft of measures, um, which, uh, sorry, a whole raft of offences which weren't included, yet we could provide evidence to say that victims of trafficking had been forced to commit these particular offences. These are necessary kind of um, additional um, loopholes and um, barriers to jump over. It begs the question what were they thinking and, and was there a lot of thought for some of the um, provisions that were drafted I get the, I, I don't know, I get the feeling sometimes that it was a rushed job um, and for me it was a learning curve in terms of the actual skill of the government to 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 speak to their own um, provisions and spin spin a lot of what they were um, doing if, if you didn't really understand the issue or you didn't really have the support of, of legal professionals to say is, is that good is that I don't think that's good but why tell me why you would go that's great they've done a great job um, so yeah I think yeah concerning that the government were so prepared to rush things so quickly and could argue so well about these provisions which weren't necessarily in the best interest of victims or even you know prosecuting traffickers for instance mm -hmm. um but i still think that um without the input of civil society the modern slavery act would be much weaker than it is now they needed there was a constant call for case studies okay so you don't want that in there you want this provision give me case studies and I can't tell you how many times you've had to try and reword the same thing um, at different stages of the scrutiny process to say this is needed because X, Y, and Z. Here's three case studies to say, okay, and then the government would go away and draft something, and you'd say no, but still this isn't working because X, Y, and Z. Here's three more case studies, and by the end of the process it was somewhat tedious. Um, but within the House of Lords, that's when the, some of the greatest gains were made because they they understood the issues more. You didn't have to provide them with 20 case studies um, and they could argue with long debates and, and really push the government to change. But if the government had the way, I think if you just went through the House of Commons and wasn't scrutinised by the Lords, it would be a much weaker act than is now currently in place. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, you spoke about spin and how you know quickly, uh, how rushed the entire process was. <coughs> But in that process, did you also sense that there were political opportunities that, you know, one could simply slip in something that the government, obviously you can't technically slip in words that they wouldn't agree to, but did you just generally step in back, see political opportunities that you thought, maybe we can, you know, maybe we can get this through? Yes, I think, um, I think, again, I was naive. Um, in thinking what we could achieve. So you create this alternative bill and you go, well, that makes sense. That's that's the best that we can do. And then you see what you're up against and there's just the small changes that you're asking to be made. Um, w wouldn't be, they wouldn't be included at all. <clears throat> um, but in terms of opportunities, there were some really good debates that were had. Um, and even small things, if you go back through Hansard, for instance, one of the things that we were really pushing for was strong victim protection measures. So having the minimum standards of protection included on the face of the bills in the actual primary legislation, because that's what they have in international 
uh, they're obligated to adhere to through the Council of Europe Trafficking Convention, the EU Trafficking Directive. Um, yet there was huge pushback on that. But by getting, I think it was peers, to, to really push the government to argue why they couldn't and why they could do so in Scotland and Northern Ireland in their respective legislation, but they couldn't in England and Wales. The government did come out with certain, you know, small um, small sentences, you know, anything that we do put in place will adhere to our international obligations, which is such a small thing, but you can then hold them to account to that and say, OK, so you've got this now national referral mechanism pilots, um, if you are going to put this in place, you've said that it must adhere to international standards, but we know X, Y, and Z. There are things that you can do, but I think one of the key things um, that the bill, uh, the bill did and the bill scrutiny did was to introduce um, reviews. And so the child trafficking advocate trial, the NRM review, even the overseas domestic worker visa review, which isn't, you know, it was so disappointing that they wouldn't put this on in the legislation, but it gives us an opportunity to carry on working on these issues and campaigning. Um, and as much as we don't agree with some of the arguments that the government came up with about putting these in, in legislation, actually, to say that overseas domestic worker visa, it's a policy change that's needed. It doesn't necessarily need to be in, in the Modern Slavery Act, but the fact that we've got this review now and hopefully James Ewan's um, independent review will come out with some kind of strong recommendations for greater protection um, and we can use use that and use those mechanisms put in place. Likewise with the anti-slavery commissioner, um, that was one of our key issues. I was, We worked really hard to extend his remit to look at victim protection. It was purely law enforcement focused um, and we were we campaigned for so hard, so long and so hard to just get those small words victim protection included in what he must uh, monitor in terms of good practice, um, and we did and it was great and I'm really pleased and it's I think reflective in his um, uh, his recently published strategy that the first priority is victim protection. I don't think that would have taken place if if we really hadn't campaigned hard because the government did not want that to be included. Um, so there are mechanisms that have now come through the through the Act, which we need to keep monitoring, we need to keep research, we keep work and engage with these bodies that have come out um, to to really make sure that this Modern Slavery Act is just the start when it's implemented fully. So what, you know, when the dust settled and the Act was, was passed, what was the sense within the ATMG as to the strengths and drawbacks of the Act? Um, I think in some um, some aspects it didn't add anything. So perhaps the offences, um, the convoluted drafting of the human trafficking offence, um, you know, it was meant to simplify and consolidate, but it just shoved you know um these different offenses into one piece of um legislation but um didn't necessarily simplify and i think even caused further problems so the the definition of exploitation for instance listed in um under human trafficking i, I mean we were we were concerned with some of the definitions of exploitation and um there was many many people that came out in terms of um critiquing what they've listed as exploitation and what makes a vulnerable person. Helen Bam Foundation were very vocal about the fact that you can dis um, uh, necessarily distinguish, you know, a mental or physical illness, but it's a, um, a vulnerability is caused by a whole kind of raft of different issues, but this wasn't reflected in the Act. So in terms of offences, we'll see if it in increases prosecutions. I, I'm, I hope so. Um, it's great that the um, sentencing has increased the life sentence, but we shall see if it's actually um, workable in practice. Um, some of the key wins, for instance, were independent child uh, trafficking advocates, um, which we didn't think, I think in terms of the children's sector, they, uh, they came together as a huge coalition and said, right, what are our three priorities? And they had... Um, the independent child guardians, which are known as advocates, um, the statutory fence to make it more um, uh, child friendly, so kind of reduce the test of compulsion, 
also introduced the normal punishment um, aspect of it as well. And also had uh, the separate child exploitation offence. And the independent child guardians, I think we, they were told towards the end of the process, the scrutiny process, like you've only got one thing, what, what do you want it to be? Um, and I think the child trafficking advocates won. And so it was a campaign win. For instance, ECPAT UK have been campaigning for 10 years to get independent child guardians introduced. And um, in their eyes, it, it is a very strong provision. Um, and the child trafficking advocates trial is nearly oh, it's completed. The evaluation will come out soon. And hopefully that will put in place some really strong child um, protection measures. Um, in terms of other wins, I guess... I guess the ATMG was set up to be the monitoring body, so the fact that we do have this commissioner um, in place is very positive and I think we need to engage with him and help him, support him in his role to um, to really direct him to the key issues that need to be focused on and hopefully in time he can grow and, and be fully independent from the government to, uh, to have that expertise to know um, who he should work with. Um, some of the weaknesses maybe the the victim protection uh, measures for, for me were one of the the most disappointing in terms of the minimum standards of uh, victim support and um, the kind of key safeguards the provision of that support so the principle of informed consent for support for adults you know and um, we wanted the framework of the national referral mechanism included in the act and so not the kind of detail of the national referral mechanism but that the government should put in place a system to identify and assist victims which um, adheres to their international obligations um, and within that you know um, appeals for decision making um, and a huge you know, just different things that would really strengthen uh, any national referral mechanism that's put in place subsequently so at the moment the, the Montserrat Act says that we have this statutory guidance and that there will, should be statutory regulations um, to direct public authorities on how to identify and assist victims. But within that, there's no detail. Um, so it's very much still for us to really work with the government to try and influence what is in the statutory regulations, what is in the guidance. And I say it's disappointing because compared to Scotland and Northern Ireland, they are so progressive. They go beyond, in some aspects, their international obligations. They talk about um, the provision of support prior to a national referral mechanism decision, um, that support could be provided for a duration which Scottish ministers see fit, for instance. Um, so really good, really strong. Um, so I think we've got more work to do in terms of in terms of that in the UK. So I guess the, the core part of the Act uh, is the, uh, the core offences. So we have sections 1, 2 and 3 and 4 actually that deal with uh, uh, what slavery and forced labour and trafficking. So what is your view on the, the definition of these core offences? You've already said that they were pretty convoluted, uh, but could you say a little bit more about uh, about the offences and the way that they were defined? Um, yeah, I think the, um, like I said, it does differ significantly from international definitions. The human trafficking, um, through, for instance, uh, there is no means within the human trafficking um, offence, um, and it doesn't take into account the particular vulnerabilities of children so it doesn't say that children don't have to consent um, sorry there's no proof of consent needed for children because a child can never consent to their exploitation um, and as I said before the the focus is on travel it's on the movement underneath that they've said that travel can mean and then list the different um, uh, acts within that which includes recruitment harboring receiving but the unnecessary focus on travel is is one of the key issues where um, uh, prosecutors found it difficult to convict traffickers because they couldn't uh, prove the chain of, of movement and the exploitation. So focusing on that travel, I think, may be difficult and may um, cause difficulties with actually prosecuting more traffickers. On the... Um, the slavery, servitude, and forced compulsory labour. 
I think the one positive that was managed to be included, which took, again, a lot of work by Baroness Lola Young, I think, to talk about um, including that um, the consent of a person to um, the acts which constitute forced labour, slavery, servitude, um, should should not uh, be considered or is not... Um, does not prevent... So if they do consent to these acts, it does not prevent a conviction under these offences because consent uh, shouldn't be a factor which is considered. Mm-hmm. And do you think that this should have been a separate offence relating to exploitation? In our um, alternative bill, we did have, um, I think it was about six offences, and we differentiated between um, children and and adults in terms of trafficking, uh, child trafficking, human trafficking for adults, um, a general exploitation offence, and then we had a child exploitation offence. Um, for the child exploitation offence, that was one of the key things we were trying to get included because we know that the thresholds for forced labour, slavery, servitude, are quite high. Um, and with uh, trafficking, it can be often hard to prove, like I said, the movement or particular aspects of the whole... Um, uh, trafficking uh, definition, so that act means purpose. So we just wanted to have a simple offence whereby um, someone who had uh, exploited a child in a, in a general way could be prosecuted. Um, but the government didn't see that that was necessary and said that um, existing children's legislation was um, sufficient. Um, however, you know we know that there's been none or very few um, convictions under this specific child legislation. Um, So yes, we were trying to get something included which would um, take into account a child's particular vulnerabilities and and say that, make it easier to convict those people that do exploit children because there would be a lower threshold and there wouldn't be a necessity to prove all the different chain of, of uh, movement or transfer and recruitment. Just the fact that they exploited a child would be sufficient. Mm-hmm. And what about adult exploitation? Did the alternative bill propose that as an offence? It did. It did. Um, again, I think because of the high thresholds. Um, but I don't think... We didn't want to... Um, push that too hard. I think that was a, going to be a hard won battle, um, and I think our priority was more for children um, who are more vulnerable than adults in that regard, and and maybe subject to exploitation. Which you know, we need to support them through that and, and convict those people that do exploit them. But for adults, I don't know. I think it was a harder case to win, so we um, we focused on children. So what would you say were some missed opportunities um, while the Act was being negotiated? Missed opportunities um, in terms of the final Act? Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, so. That some of the key things were maybe getting non-prosecution um, and non-punishment provision into the Act. So we have a statutory offence, the wording of which I think is problematic. There's a reasonable person test and you know you have a whole raft of offences which aren't covered under it. Um, but the non-punishment provision um, we want to see included Article 26 of the Council of Europe Trafficking Convention, Article 8 of the EU Trafficking Directive provides for uh, this non-punishment provision that states uh, should consider not prosecuting or punishing um, victims of trafficking for offences that they've been forced to commit as a result of their trafficking. Um, and the statute of offence to us was very much a last line kind of defence. So by that point, you'll be in court, at which point you might already have um, suffered secondary victimisation by the fact that you've been you know, treated as a criminal. If we could have the non-punishment provision included within um, the primary legislation, then it would be a duty on on um, police and prosecutors to to at the very first stage um, look for trafficking and be more aware of trafficking indicators so that it didn't get to the stage where they had to use the statutory defence. We know through research that we've done that there's a huge number of people that are um, still being convicted of, of 
for instance, cannabis offences, so the Race in Europe project, which I talked about, the anti-slavery project, which was done with ECPAP too, you know, we did like a media search of um, cases of um, Vietnamese nationals who had been prosecuted for cannabis conviction, uh, cannabis offences, and went through even the media reports to look at the judgment's testimony um, and they acknowledged that the person had been exploited, that they were at the bottom of this rung of the ladder and they were getting paid, they couldn't leave, yet they still gave them a two-year sentence, which we know if, if a Vietnamese national has a two-year sentence and tries to go home, they are going to be in serious trouble with um, uh, the authorities in Vietnam. Uh, just a huge problem and I think it needs greater attention. I think this, this Modern Slavery Act would have been the measure through which you could have brought that further attention to this issue. Um, like I said, the uh, victim protection, I think we could have much stronger victim protection measures in the Act, on the face of the Act, so that anything that's introduced subsequently, so any policy changes, must adhere to these minimum standards within the Modern Slavery Act. And I think domestic workers as well. Um, for me, that was such a disappointment. I think um, I think Kellyanne would be able to speak to this more, but um, it is all that is required to reinstate the protections pre twenty twelve is a v is a policy change. It's not necessarily through legislation, but this modern slavery act was such a an opportunity to raise this issue and make sure it was recognised as as a really fundamental and. The strength of feeling from all of the scrutiny, scrutiny committees um, and MPs and peers tasked with scrutinising the bill was that this really had to you know, strengthen the hand of the slave master, which is the key kind of quote that came out, uh, and recognise that um, if we are going to be this world-leading body on, on, on slavery, then we need to really consider these domestic workers. And there was so much support generated. Lord Hilton was incredible. He put forward this amendment with the support of you know Justice for Domestic Workers and Callianne, and um, it won. It was fantastic. We thought this is this is great. This is finally it. And then it was overturned. Um, and to me, that's somewhat indicative of somewhat tokenistic response by the government to this issue about we really want to be victim focused, yet we're so maybe concerned with their image um, in terms of immigration that they didn't want to put in place um, protection measures because they might be seen to be soft on immigration. I, I struggle to find the reasoning aside from that why they would be so adamant that this shouldn't be included and the arguments that they came back with um, time and time again you know we, we came back with further further evidence and yet they still rejected it. Um, so a huge disappointment, but like I said, Overseas Domestic Worker Visa Review was a product of those debates, um, so there's still opportunities, but yeah, disappointing all the same. Mm -hmm. Were there any unexpected wins? I mean, clearly some of these issues were hard fought and you, know, you didn't get what you wanted, but you had some promise of uh, But were there some unexpected wins that you never saw coming? I mean, clearly... Anyone who's a criminal lawyer and looks at the act would be surprised to see something on supply chains, for example. Yes, I think that was a late late starter. Um, that was really a product of business coming together and saying that they wanted to, you know, level the playing field so that they um, weren't being undercut by those who were using forced labour. I'd like to think there was some ethical kind of reasoning in there, but perhaps perhaps not. If that's the case, that's fine. Um, if it's just a business um, decision. Um, and, yeah, I mean, they they managed with, I think there's a core coalition, um, to, to come together and bring together organisations, um, NGOs working on this, businesses, and others who were interested in getting transparency supply chains provision included. Um, and that, I think, just shows the power of business sometimes. If, if, they, if they do want to act, they, they can, and they had a lot of influence. So yes, very pleased to see it included. I think maybe for those again who went on with like real high, um, high asks, um, it doesn't necessarily have the any sanctions or particular teeth. Um, you, you, if a business does report on, on forced labour in their supply chains or slavery in their supply chains, there's not really anything that you can do about it. There's no comeback to them. There's no sanctions that are enforced. 
Um, likewise, if they don't report. Um, but I think it's a good start um, and uh, perhaps it could be used as a tool, this reporting mechanism could be used as a tool um, you know, to generate public um, interest in this issue, you know, consumer kind of power could be uh, created through saying this, this organisation, sorry, this business has reported on supply chains. Um, and like I said, we could use the, um, the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner to to really try and hold business account to, to really influence um, how well they report and, and what's done about this, this reporting. It's, it's to be seen. Mm-hmm. So what is the political mood within the ATMG? Now, you know, it's been almost six, seven months since the Act was passed. Um, I think, <laughs> to be honest, it, it took up a lot of our time. It was the key focus. Um, and I think we need time to step back and, because you're so closely involved with it, everyone was so, um, worked so hard with MPs and some peers who were just wonderful and really tried to help move this piece of legislation along, that there was undoubtedly disappointment felt when it was passed. But I think when I've spoken to people subsequently, they say, well, no, actually, it has, it was significantly strengthened and we should take this away and build on what was, on um, what the final kind of act uh, provided. Um, so what we've been doing now is we are in the process of starting to monitor the implementation of the act. Um, like I said, working with these key mechanisms and bodies that have been produced through the act, so the commissioner, child trafficking advocates, um, the NRM pilots, we are very heavily involved in that. Um, and through our continued research and monitoring uh, and influence, try and um, shape the implementation of, of the legislation. Um, I think, uh, yeah. So what's your sense? It's too soon to say, but are you getting some flavour for how the Act is being enforced? I think it's too soon to tell. Um, so, for instance, the only the uh, offences and commissioner and um, transfer supply chains. Only certain things have come into to to place and um, have you know what's the word been enacted. What's the word? Um, and I think maybe start of next year. That's when we really need to start drilling down into different provisions and and finding some way of monitoring. Um, how they are being implemented, for instance, the offences, how many people have been convicted. With the Commissioner, um, he has been undertaking a lot of work already. He's, like I said, produced his strategic plan. Um, there's a lot of things within that plan that we can engage with and support him with, and uh, we'd like to, to be able to do so. Um, I think with the, the NRM pilots, that will take another, you know, six to nine months before they're finalised, and only then will the the kind of guidance and um, the regulations um, be, you know, formalised. I think the drafting process will begin next year, but we need to see the outcomes of of the pilots first. Um, so yeah, there's. A, I think it's just an it's a starting to monitor process, if that makes sense. We haven't properly engaged as yet. Mm-hmm. So what's your? I mean have a very good pulse for the way that this government thinks of uh, modern slavery. Um, so with that in mind, what, what is your sense of the likely consequences of the enforcement of this act? Is this, you know, criminal law is often passed by all sorts of political parties in power um, to, you know, signal symbolically that they, they care about a certain issue. I mean, just so looking forward and having monitored in the past the way that provisions that are now the foundation of the Modern Slavery Act had been implemented in the past, what is your sense looking forward of, you know, the likely consequences? Uh, are there certain sectors where there'll be more implementation or, mm. uh, or is it really dead in the water in a certain sense? I think there is a very real danger that... Um, the this modern slavery act will be used as um, a tool by the government to say that they have everything covered. That now that this legislation is 
is in place, we're fine, we've got all these um, uh, different aspects under control. Um, and I think that's again where civil society come in to say, well, actually no, our experience on the uh, front line is that this is still an issue and this hasn't quite been covered. I also say a lot of the things that have um, been included in the Monday React require a lot of training from public authorities and others to, to implement. If I just look at the, um, uh, the national referral mechanism, the whole structure of that is bringing it down to the more local level, which is fantastic. Uh, Multi-agency decision-making, great. Slavery safeguarding these within all public authorities. Again, if you can train all these public authorities, which is one of the things we've been calling for, a lack of knowledge about the indicators of trafficking, where to refer victims, that's been an issue that we've, we've talked about for a while. But unless you train your local authorities, unless you invest in the money and the time to train uh, public authorities to implement this act, then you're in, in danger of... Um, having you know making further changes which just confuse people rather than simplify and and improve uh, identification and assistance to victims and prosecutions um i think there's a, a number of policy changes uh, and sorry, a guidance that needs to be produced in terms of the implementation of the act um and I'd like to see a lot more involvement in the consultation around that guidance, a lot more involvement of those parties that will be implementing um, that particular uh, provision um, so that it is it's really kind of a bottom-up rather than just a top-down piece of legislation that um, people won't know about. I mean, local authorities, for instance, are totally overstretched and under-resourced and just asking them to do one more thing is is unfair and they will fall for more negative criticism when actually um, they need support in in being able to implement the provision so so this is obviously there's a lot of work to be done on the ground but thinking long term considering that ATMG spent a considerable amount of time setting up this alternative bill are there significant provisions of the bill that you would like to see incorporated into the Modern Slavery Act going forward? And if so, you know, what are the possibilities for future amendments? Or is any reform now going forward purely to be undertaken at the institutional level, as you've just indicated? Um, do you think there will be an opportunity to, in fact, revisit the text of the primary legislation? Perhaps. Perhaps. I think, um, again, if it can be proven, for instance, that um, there are particular aspects of the Modern Slavery Act which are, you know, not working and not in the best interest of victims, then, then of course, opportunities will be looked at in terms of other secondary legislation or um, opportunities in other bills that are coming forward. Um, I think, I think a lot of it will be, though, that at the institutional level. Um, it will be more the policy changes that are made. Um, there are things, you know, for, when I talk about, you asked about the alternative bill. The alternative bill was so wide ranging, you know, even things like compensation, for instance. There, there, there must be, there should be uh, other pieces of legislation in which we can try and influence um, changes. But I think they all. And I don't think we've come up with a strategic plan yet as to which piece of legislation, because they're so piecemeal, they come up ad hoc. Um, but I think it is more on the... Going back to what we were doing originally, which is the research and looking at the particular um, provisions within the Modern Slavery Act um, and... Excuse me. Uh, provisions within the Modern Slavery Act and... Uh, doing targeted research to look at particular aspects. But actually, I think we also need to remember that the Modern Slavery Act was just a national piece of legislation, but actually our remit is international obligations. So how well the UK is here in, adhering to international uh, obligations. And I think maybe some of the criticism that I would have had for the government is that they were very inward-focused rather than and I think there's only a couple of mentions to international legislation in the Modern Slavery Act. The Anti-Slavery Commissioner, for instance, um, 
He's looking just within the UK. He's, yes, he's engaging with international bodies, but nowhere within his strategic plan says, I'm going to look at how well the UK is adhering to um, what it says in the Council of Europe or EU trafficking directive. Um, so I think there is still a role um, for civil society to try and work alongside these mechanisms to to again give the give big picture again. So yes, this is great that you're doing that in the UK, but actually, how well are you adhering to these standards? So I'm trying to infuse the domestic legal scene with you know inputs from say international law or model legislation which is you know being passed around the world. Uh, how does one do that? How do you draw, or do you have insight beneficial models in other countries uh, and contexts which you think could be used uh, in the UK? Um, yeah, the the ATMG's uh, remit is um, just UK focused. However, you of course have monitoring bodies such as Greta, the group of experts um, on the the trafficking convention. And we regularly engage with those bodies um, and they report on different um, EU countries and good practice is identified within them, also uh, issues that the, the countries need to um, work on. So we very much look to the European Commission, Greta, um, for uh, support, um, advice. They obviously report on how well the UK is doing and adhering to its international uh, obligations. Um, in terms of other countries, yes, that was one of the the key kind of sticking points when the government first introduced the draft bill, saying that this was a world leading piece of legislation. Yes, it had no victim protection measures. Um, the commissioner's role was not really rapporteur um, as such; it was more uh, a national coordinator. Um, and I think even at that stage, we could draw on you know um, even the US, for instance, has. A comprehensive piece of legislation which has it victim protection included and say this isn't um this isn't as high a standard as what they've got in the US, even you know, Italy and <clears throat> different countries. Like I think as well taking particular examples, so from the Netherlands, the National Rapporteur, the Dutch National Rapporteur, you know, using that as the gold standard, also the Finnish um uh, rapporteur as well. Um saying this is what they are using, this is shown to be successful. Could you, you know, could we adhere to more about what they're doing? Um, so yes, I think there's there's still scope to to compare the UK and and I think hold them to account again with their rhetoric. So when you've got like say for instance the immigration bill that's been kind of recently um, announced, they talk about the rights of victims and protection for victims. Yet at the same time, introducing a piece of legislation which may negatively impact on victims, may increase exploitation. And, and really using, like I said, all the rhetoric around the modern slavery bill to to try and challenge further pieces of legislation which may impact on human trafficking victims. So that's convoluted. Mm -hmm. so that, that's actually fascinating. So here is a question that struck me as you've been speaking um, so fascinatingly about different sources of primary legislation, guidance, regulation, secondary legislation, um, and being able to you know, engage in many different roles with policymakers. Uh, for an activist, right, I mean, this clearly you need to have a, a whole range of skills. What, what have you been able to, where have you been able to find the resources and the expertise to actually satisfy this wide-ranging set mm. of roles? And, you know, in terms of resources, what, what, what does an activist in this milieu need in order to actually... Uh, you know, achieve substantial change. Mm. Um, so the the ATMG is made up of a huge range of different organisations, each of which have a either a specialism. You know, we have uh, the Tara Project in Scotland, which is obviously Scotland focused, um, works with um, women who have been sexually exploited. Um, you have ECPAT UK, which works on child trafficking. You've got UNICEF. You've got Kalyan, which is just focused on domestic workers. You've got Afruka, African, you know, um, children who have been um, trafficked. A huge range and, and of expertise within there, um, and I think that was uh, one of the strengths and the only way that we could work on this one Savior Act, which did cover a lot of issues, was to sp divide our time, work out what our specialisms were, and also tap into, you know, who can provide case studies to illustrate this point. That's real, really one of the strengths I think of the ATMG. If if someone has an issue, 
and they are working directly with um, policymakers, MPs. They sometimes need a case to go, this has happened before, I know this has happened before, and this is why it's detrimental, and reach out and say, can you can you support me in this and provide evidence? Uh, and people do, and then it works. I think for an activist, um, strength in numbers, you know, organisation, collaboration, every different organisation will have um, a different strength um, uh, and understanding to bring to the table. And yes, it can be difficult when you're trying to coordinate and be kind of quite focused on what you're trying to, you know, adv advocacy targets are very narrow and you have to kind of narrow down what your focus is. Clearly, there are going to be people within that group that want to focus on something else. Um, but finding allies within um, within the, the sector and also allies within, um, you know, Parliament. There are some, you know experts in their own right within parliament who are willing to support you and take the time out to meet you and discuss this raise this issue um and i think you know that was reflected in the modern slavery there's some amazing um people who really lord hilton for instance i know he's he's talked about a lot but he really you know he was an expert in his own right he's he drafted all these briefing papers by himself um, and he spoke so passionately that he infused others around him. That's what you need. You need an ally within um, uh, Parliament. And I think the UNICEF UK, for instance, because of their large staff, um, they do have people specifically focused on, on um, working with MPs. And that for the ATMG, I think, was really helpful just to be able to get contacts um, and, uh, you know, they already had made uh, met with this MP previously and had a good relationship. So, so building on those relationships are already established. Um, and yeah, in terms of activism, I think you know this is kind of the basics of strategy. But um, what are your key asks? Be very clear about them uh, and be able to consider as well. Take time to think about what the comeback will be. You know, look at the political kind of uh, field and say, okay, what's what's the mood at the moment? Are they anti this, anti that? What have they been working on? How can we develop and, and build on what they've already done? But also think they're going to say no because X, Y and Z. How do we sell it to them? So, yeah, be clear, collaborate, organise um, and share resources. It's amazing. So here is your crystal ball moment because you've been so lucid and inspiring so far. Um, where do you think this field of modern slavery and trafficking is going? You know, how would you think it might develop over the next 10 years? Um, we are seeing increasing numbers recognised through the National Forum Mechanism um, of trafficking victims. Now the, the NRM is going to include all modern slavery, um, all forms of modern slavery. So I think we will see an increasing number. I don't think this number is going to go down, despite having a modern slavery act. Um, my concern is is that there will be increasing demands on those on the front line to identify victims, provide support. At the same time, the government will restrict uh, the funds available to uh, enable them to do this adequately. Um, I'd like to see the commissioner's role develop um, for him to work alongside civil society to identify these issues and really push the government to to do its best to identify and assist victims to the, to the extent that they should. Um, you know, I'm hopeful there's some great organisations in the field, but I'm also concerned that this squeezing of budgets is um, causing the close of organisations such as um, Eves for Women. Um, so the Poppy Project are a project within Eve's Women, but Eve's closed down at the end of August. Now they were a very victim-focused organisation and had very high standards of victim care, but the um, the money that was being provided to them was sometimes being uh, given to other organisations which could see more victims in a short space of time. So my concern is that there will be you know a streamlining, which will not be in the benefit of victims and actually will just um, exacerbate exploitation and, and re-trafficking. Mm -hmm. So what, how should we think of strategies going forward? So I was wondering if you could speak to a few key maximum impact strategies that you think NGOs and academics and policymakers 
should pursue in really addressing the gaps within the Modern Slavery Act going forward? Um, I think uh, we need to challenge um, perhaps some of the government rhetoric and by doing so we undertake um, evidence-based research to say why this is still an issue, bring to the table kind of uh, clear key facts, um, evidence from the front line and then use that um, I think there's a lot of organisations which are already established in terms of working directly with um, the government, you know, they're part of strategy meetings and those kind of things. So feeding that information in to uh, to those organisations which have influence. Um, I think in this time, day and age we, we live in a time where the media has a huge influence and I don't think we should forget that. I think uh, use... Uh, I think if we, if the key things we can challenge the government through is the media. Um, so really working with to, to both uh, increase public awareness and knowledge, but also you know use the media to um, share this these research findings and our key advocacy uh, recommendations and asks, because I think the government does respond to some degree to well to quite a high degree to to the pressure from the media. That's good. Thank you very much uh, for speaking about the Act and we wish you well.